Good evening, explorers! I'm Exploratory from the Nevada Conservation League, and welcome to another episode of Native Nevada Nature, your weekly series to highlight one plant or one animal species. Uh, with me today, we have a very special guest, so if everybody can give a warm Explorer welcome to Explorer Tyler, that would be great. Explorer Tyler, say hi. Hey everyone, thank you for having me on. I'm really excited to be here. Awesome, we're excited to have you and we're excited to highlight this next animal species. So for today, we're going to be talking about the horned lizard. Now, Explorer Tyler, when you were a kid, what did you call the horned lizard? Well, growing up out here, uh, chasing these things down in the desert, we would call them horny toads or horned toads. Yep, same with me. I've always known them as horny toads or horned toads, but in fact, they aren't actually toads. They are horned lizards. So we're going to give them the benefit of the doubt and call them horned lizards throughout the presentation. But if you hear around your desert or in your backyard about horny toads, they are the same thing. Specifically, we're going to be talking a lot about the desert horned lizard, where you're going to find it here in Nevada. This is Ferrisoma pav pav sorry, Plathiorhinos, uh, genus species. Ferrisoma means toad body, which is probably where they got the horny toad name. And it's said to be toad-like or toad in appearance. Uh, the Plathiorhinos comes from the Greek word plathes, which means flat and rhinos, which mean no nose, which refers to their flat nose. Uh, pretty simple to remember. Now, Explorer Tyler, would you tell us a little bit more about the horned lizards, some fun facts about them? Yes, I'd love to. They're actually a really popular little lizard. Um, the genus of horned lizards is the official state reptile of Wyoming, and Texas designated the Texas horned lizard uh, Phrynosoma cornutonum, <laughs> sorry if that's butchered, as the official state reptile in 1993. And the TCU horned frog is the mascot of Texas Christian University in Fort Worth, Texas. And as far as I know, TCU is the only athletic team with the horned lizard well, as a mascot. What a mighty little creature to have as their mascot. Oh yeah, they love him in Texas. All right, uh, now we're going to go over on how to identify them. So first off, they're toad bodied, which pretty much describes them very well. They are notable for having flat, broad bodies, rounded snout, and a short, broad tail. Um, in most species, they have a head and their temples are crowned with very pointy, sharp horns. And they usually have a uh, fringed scales on the side of their tail and the sides of their body as well. For our desert horned lizard, the best way to identify them from other species of horned lizard is that they have only one row of fringe scales on each side of the body. So if you look at the picture on the top right corner, you'll see a row of little fringe scales on the side, little tiny um, spines. In other species, there'll be two or three rows, but for our desert horned lizard, just one. They also have a row of slightly enlarged scales on each side of their throat. Um, you'll see it in the picture. I have the little box on the bottom right-hand corner. Um, one row of enlarged scales, and they'll have enlarged chin shields. So they have a little bit of spines around their chin. It is. Impressive. The next slide I have is all the skeletal views of the species of horned lizards. There are 14 recognized species of horned lizards, all which are closely related to earless lizards, spiny lizards, and the California rock and fringe toad lizards. Um, our specific horned lizard, Plathia rhinos, right at the bottom in the red box, you can see that it has two prominent horns at the top, and then those uh, small spinies, uh, Smaller, scale, uh, smaller scales and horns on the sides of its mouth. Uh, so that's the best way to tell them apart between each of the species. All species have their own type of crown or type of horn formation, so you can really use that to tell them apart. And of course, there are subspecies. We actually have two subspecies of desert horned lizards. 
we have the southern desert horn lizard which you can find in the mojave desert so uh southern nevada Col uh, california uh, arizona and then the northern desert horned lizard which you can find in the great basin up in wyoming utah and northern nevada best way to tell them apart is the southern desert horned lizard which is Ferrisoma platyrrhinos calidiarum uh, is that they have really large horns. They say the horns are more than 45% of the head length, um, so very tall, and that the spaces in between them aren't as long as their horns. Whereas the northern desert horned lizard, which is just Ferrisoma platyrrhinos platyrrhinos, has horns that are less than 45% of their head length. So smaller horns and the spaces between them equal exactly as the width of their horns. Uh, they, have, they also say that the southern one has a tail that is more flat and the northern one has a tip of the tail more round. Of course, you might not be able to tell the difference between the two unless you have them side by side. But if you see larger horns, more than likely it's the southern desert horned lizard. And can you tell the males and females apart? one another that's a really good question you can uh the best the easiest way to tell them apart without actually uh looking at their undersides is to see their size male horned lizards are actually smaller than females which is an unusual characteristic for most lizards usually you find males to be much bigger because they engage in male-to-male -male combat they gotta fight but horned lizards actually don't seem to be territorially aggressive. They don't seem to be fighting for territory. Instead, they tend to be smaller than females because they want to conserve their energy to search for females instead of maintaining a large body size. So if you have two lizards next to each other and one's bigger and one's smaller, more likely the bigger one's female and the smaller one is male. Of course, it's really hard to tell size difference unless you have one to compare it to. Um, so the only other way of telling the sex of a lizard is to flip it over on its backside. Now, explorers, I'm warning you, don't go turn it around flip, uh, lizards just to figure out if they're male or female. You want to respect all wildlife and stay away from them, as far away from them as you can. But this is the scientific way to uh, identify the sex of a lizard. So turn it around. You're going to look for small holes on the legs and the belly. These are called femoral pores. If the pores are big, they're male. If they're small, they're female. Uh, you're going to look in between its legs and its tail. You're going to look for a big bulge. This is called the hemipenal bulge. If there is a bulge, it's a male. No bulge, female. Last but not least, you'll see this in the picture to the right. You'll see two little arrows pointing at these very prominent scales. These are called post-anal scales. If they are present, they're male. No present, no scales, female. Of course, some males look more female and some females look more male, so these aren't clear cut, but that is the scientific way to identify a lizard in the field. All right, so now that we know how to identify them and what they look like, Explorer Tyler, would you tell us where we can find them? Happy to. So the horned lizard is home to arid and within Western North America. This includes the Southwest United States, Mexico, and even as far South as Guatemala. The most common horned lizard in the Western desert is aptly named the desert horned lizard, which you already described, um, consisting of two subspecies, the Northern platyrrhinos platyrrhinos, which inhabits the Great Basin, and the southern, Platyrrhinos calidarium, which inhabits the Sonoran and Mojave deserts, including all the way to uh, northern California, uh, northern Baja, California. Mm -hmm. You can see these maps up here on the left describes all the regions of the horned lizards across North America. And then on the right is just our particular desert horned lizard. Uh, so we know where geographically they are, but what about their habitat? So the desert horned lizards are found, like I said, in the Mojave, Sonoran, and Great Basin deserts. Therefore, they've adapted really well to living in these desert arid environments. 
Horned lizards are exceptionally camouflaged for their desert environment, choosing to remain still to avoid predation. Uh, their colors, textures all help them blend into these desert surroundings, and they're often partially buried in the desert to even conceal them further. Um, they further them, they've also been observed bur burying themselves in sandy soil for hibernating and to get away from uh, extreme weather. So these things are so, uh, so adept and so well suited for desert camouflage that oftentimes they choose to just stay still and not exactly. be seen. Exactly. Uh, we have a video up right now. And I don't know if viewers, explorers, if you guys can even see the horned lizard that's in this video. So well camouflaged. Yeah, we actually found that one out there in the desert walking around the um, Ice Age Fossil State oh. Park. And we barely recognized it um, until it scurried past wow. us. Well, camouflage can't be the only thing that it helps to live out here. Uh, what other defenses are there? Yes, being a uh, large-bellied lizard, they've actually come up with a few specialized defenses to help them survive out here. Um, when threatened, the horned lizards will distend their bodies. They fill their lungs to make them look larger. This helps them appear more imposing while also appearing to be harder to swallow for any prospective uh, predators. Horn lizards are adapted or have also adapted a special defense mechanism for deterring predators. At least eight species are able to squirt an aimed stream of blood from the corner of their eyes, and they can shoot this blood a distance of up to five feet. They do this by restricting blood flow from leaving the head. This increases blood pressure and ruptures tiny blood vessels around the eyelids. The blood not only confuses predators, but it also tastes really foul um, to canine and feline predators especially. It appears to have no effect against predatory birds, but it certainly is uh, foul tasting enough to deter a lot of their natural uh, predators. Now, while previously thought our previous thought held that compounds were added to the blood from glands that occur in the ocular sinus cavity. But research has shown that chemical compounds that make up the defenses are already circulating in the blood. So that foul smell and that foul taste is already current in the lizard's bloodstream. Um, it's possible that their diet, which consists mainly of venomous harvester ants, could be a factor. Uh, however, the origin and structure of the chemicals responsible for this foul taste and odor are still unknown. That sounds very disgusting. <laughs> it is. And um, to couple my explanation, we actually have a really interesting video coming up next. It is going to show the lizard's defense squirting blood out of its eyes. So anyone who is squeamish or maybe doesn't like or doesn't want to see blood should probably turn away now. But we are definitely going to share this really special defense mechanism um, with the rest of our viewers now. All right. So the video is about 20 seconds long. So if you don't like to see blood, close your eyes for 20 seconds. But here we go. Ugh. Oof. That is, that is one and powerful stream. It really can shoot five feet. I've seen a, a few other videos when researching this, and it's quite impressive. It's gracious. Oh. Uh, well. So I don't know about you, but I lost my appetite, and I won't be eating any horned <laughs> lizards tonight. Me too. It's probably a good wa reason why they squirt the blood out. Keeps things from wanting to eat them. <laughs> mm -hmm. So Effective. we're going to talk about more about the horned lizard, not so much about their blood squirting anymore, but... We're going to talk about the life as a horned lizard. What is it like day to day to be a horned lizard? So first off, in the fall, they hibernate, hibernate by burying themselves in the sand, just as we said before. They'll emerge in spring when the sun rays have reached a very certain temperature. A lot of reptiles are attuned to certain temperatures and will emerge when that temperature is reached. Like all reptiles, the horned lizards are cold-blooded which means that they depend on the sun and their environment to warm themselves up and get energy. So they'll spend the first few hours of their day basking in the sun. They'll flatten out their toed bodies and angle their backs to get the maximum amount of sun and radiation. And once they're warmed up enough, they'll start hunting small insect prey throughout the day. Once they're full and done feeding, uh, the lizards will escape the heat by finding shade in the nearby desert. 
Um, if if it gets way too hot or they're done for the day, it, they will bury themselves in the sand for the night. Uh, it's funny when they try to dig themselves in. I've heard that they'll stick their nose in the sand and uh, like a blade of shovel, they'll wiggle around in the dirt. They'll flatten their bodies and use the spiny border of their sides like a shovel and scoop and dig their way into the sand. Sometimes they bury themselves three or four inches deep, and other times they may just leave the top of their head and eyes exposed. Uh, mating season is between April and June, and they lay eggs at about mid-July into August. Uh, some species of horned lizards bury their eggs in the nearby sand, and it takes about several weeks for them to incubate and then hatch. However, some eggs are retained by the parent, and the egg hatches either during or after being laid. It's pretty incredible. Wow, so these are almost like live birth. Pretty then. close to it. It's pretty crazy. There are reptiles that do live birth, but this guy is doing pretty much both, laying eggs and giving live birth. <laughs> mm -hmm. wow. The horned lizard can lay between 10 and 30 eggs at once. Uh, once the young emerge, they're about one inch in length, little tiny miniature versions of their parents, and then they immediately bury themselves in the nearby sand. They were, uh, they're born without anti-parental care or any help, so they literally just have to fend for themselves after birth. And after about three years or so, they are considered adults and therefore can start mating and producing their own eggs. Uh, as I mentioned before, they'll eat insects. They'll feed on slow-moving, ground-dwelling insects. Uh, examples include spiders, sow bugs, some ticks, even things like butterflies or finx moss larvae. However, ants seem to be their major food source. Uh, they'll pretty much exclusively eat ants if they can, and some horned lizards become obligate eaters, which means that they will only eat one specific species of ants. Uh, it's really pretty crazy. Um, they say that they'll come over where the ants are, they'll pose over it in like a toad-like black fashion and flick their tongue out, long sticky tongue to get some ants. And then once the ants start to be disturbed and start to chase them, he'll flee as rapidly as a startled mouse. <laughs> they really hold a, a very special niche in the ecosystem. They're very specialized little guys. Exactly. Coming they away. are the pest controls uh, of the environment. Uh, so you might pay your bug guy to come spray your house, but these guys will eat your ants for free. <laughs> <laughs> Their predators include prairie falcons, loggerhead shrikes, long-nosed leopard lizards, and striped whip snakes. So other reptiles, other bigger reptiles, and other bigger uh, birds of prey. Uh, so now that we've discussed what their role in the community is, what their role in the desert, uh, Explorer Tyler, why don't you tell us about their cultural importance? Yeah, so right here you can see that the horned lizards appeared many times in indigenous and Native American artwork. On the top left, we have some petroglyphs, and it actually shows a Native American holding an atlatl, which is a, a primitive spear that was used in the day. And at his feet is, are two horned lizards, and on his side is also a giant serpent. Um, you can see these petroglyphs throughout the Southwest, and more than one tribe are attributed to having uh, noted them. This rock up here on the top right is actually a petroglyph from Lake Hart Mountain National Antelope Refuge. And uh, we have a few other instances of Native American culture and importance surrounding the uh, horned lizard. Very cool. They kind of look like toads to me. <laughs> you can see the horns on the top right photo. And they really did depict them specifically as being um, small bulls. And you'll see that there's some nicknames and monikers given to that as well. Awesome. Looks like we have some uh, uh, different references in other cultures as well. Yes. Um, the horned lizard actually represents many things to native cultures and collectors alike. The horned toad is often said to represent self-reliance and longevity. It can protect its owner from harm and it symbolizes ancestral bounty. Lizards may also carry dreaming and foresight powers, 
and hold within themselves ancient secrets. Wow. And you can see here there are uh, two Zuni horned lizard totem carvings. And they would oftentimes use uh, sapphire and stones and precious stones in them as well. Very, They're very beautiful. This one looks a little scary, though. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, they actually played a couple roles in Native American society. So the Piman people of southern Arizona believe horned lizards can cure them of stain sickness. They do this by appealing to the lizard's strength and showing their respect to the animal. They formulate a cure by singing at a patient's side songs describing the lizards and their behavior. A horned lizard fetish or totem may be placed on an afflicted person's body during the songs. Native Mexican people also respect horned lizards, attributing the words, don't tread on me. I am the color of the earth and I hold the world. Therefore, walk carefully that you do not tread on me. Um, it's a common Mexican name for horned lizards is Torito de la Virgen or the Virgin's little bull. This name uh, apparently was given to the lizards both because of their horns and because the horned lizards are sacred to many people due to their blood squirting behaviors. This has also been given the name Weeping Tears of Blood. I mean, I would definitely think something magical or worship something that squirted blood out their eyes. <laughs> There's something special going on with this little guy. All right, so we're looking at Native American culture. Let's go even further back. All right, so right here we're going to be looking at the fossil records for the horned lizard. A uh, phrynosoma is thought to have split from an ancestor shared with the sand lizards during the late Oligocene, early Miocene periods, about 23 to 30 million years ago. Most horned lizard species are well represented in the fossil record by the Pleistocene, so about 1 million years ago, they're really well represented. Um, the northern species, the Phrynosaurum corintum, is found in the upper Pliocene about 3 million years ago. And the Phytosoma douglasi is known from the middle Miocene about 15 million years ago. Three species have gone extinct in the late Pliocene that we know of. And today we know of 16 species and subspecies living of Phytosoma that inhabit the western half of North American continent. Um, like I said, from Canada all the way down to northern Guatemala. And right here we can actually see a photo of a horned lizard spike. This is a fossil that is dated back to 10,000 years ago, and that would place it during the Pleistocene era, which is considered the, uh, the Ice Age, the Great Ice Age. So Goodness. Really? It seems like these uh, desert creatures are around when there was an Ice Age. Seems a little unreal. Yeah, they've been here for millions of years, and they've shown an ability to adapt and overcome um, a lot of the challenges that were thrown uh, at them. Speaking of adapting and uh, confronting challenges, it's always good to look in the past and see how they were, you know, back then. But it's always good to take a look into the future and see what our current conservation status is for our animal. So, the desert horned lizard, our species here in Nevada, is considered least concern, which means they have stable populations, which is always good news. We love to hear that. There are, however, other horned lizards that are considered endangered or threatened. In 2014, in Tucson, Arizona, they petitioned to have the Texas horned lizard put on the endangered species list due to the massive decline of the population in Oklahoma, uh, where it was once plentiful. Uh, they say that the Center of Biological Diversity is seeking protection for the animal on a federal level. It said that reptiles in general are dying off to about 10,000 times their historic extinc extinction rate, greatly due to human influences. So even though our desert horned lizard is doing fine, they are still greatly affected by human uh, influences. Uh, so for instance, habitat loss, we are living on their land and we've kind of kicked them out. Uh, human eradication of ant populations is actually a really big thing. We already mentioned that they become obligate eaters. They eat only one species of ants. And if we are using our bug guy to come do pest control on our ants, the lizard no longer has food to eat. There's even displacement of native ant populations by invading 
uh, populations. There's an invasive fire ant, a fire ant that wasn't here, that has been brought here by humans, that is killing off our desert ants, our native ants, therefore affecting the desert horned wow. lizards. Yeah, exactly. Um, there's even things like predation between domestic dogs and cats. My own cat, unfortunately, had an incident with the lizard that ended in the lizard's life. So it's not uncommon to see uh, pets affecting uh, wildlife populations. Um, there's also like recreational uh, activities in the desert. If you're riding around in an ATV, you might run one over. And it seems another big concern is the pet trade industry. A lot of people are trying to take desert horned lizards and give them off as pets. But since we've already mentioned, they become dependent on eating one uh, ant species. They depend on living in these desert conditions. So when you take them from their, their home and you bring them into your air conditioned home, you'll find that uh, there are plenty of deaths due to improper diet and inadequate places to live. Um, so they're definitely trying to keep a hold of that uh, fishing department of fishing game is definitely putting the authority on this as of september 23rd the nevada board of wildlife voted to ban commercial collection of reptiles in nevada um, after 2018 the state was no longer they no longer allowed unrestricted take of reptiles and for private profit and Nevada is not the only state that has done this there's been plenty of others nearby in the west that have followed as well basically trying to help the unnecessary take of reptiles from their wild habitat into uh, our domesticated human urban cities. Uh, so uh, as always, if you want to get into desert uh, conservation, you want to learn how you could protect the horned lizard or protect other wildlife right in your backyard, you can always talk to me or explore Tyler after this. Uh, we are always doing active work in the community, doing climate action. So if you want to get involved, always let us know. Um, but I think that's all we have, Explorer Tyler, right? Yeah, that was our last slide. Um, really enjoyed the videos that we were able to put together for this as well. I hope that the uh, defense specialization of the eye squirting didn't turn anybody <laughs> off. Um, so we're going to open it up to questions. If anybody has any questions right now and you're watching live on Facebook, go ahead and just put them in the comments section and we'll see if we can answer them pretty quickly. And it looks like we already have a quick question. Is the blood poisonous? Uh, and we did cover that a little bit um, where the, the blood isn't necessarily poisonous. It's that it carries certain properties that make it smell and taste unpleasant to would-be predators. So it's more of a deterrent rather than an actual poison. Exactly. And they, they actual compound that causes this smell and taste isn't exactly known. There's still research going on, but it is believed that their specialized diet of eating specific ants that are toxic have caused the toxicity to build up within their system. And we do know that this toxicity runs throughout the blood of the, the creature. It's not held in one particular point. Um, for a long time, they thought there might have been ocular and sinus cavities that could be producing the toxins um, that are producing that noxious taste and smell. But it turns out that the blood system carries it throughout. Do you think that if a predator were to eat a horned lizard, that the toxicity running throughout their blood would make the horned lizard venomous and therefore, you know, make them sick to digest it? I'm not an expert here, but I'm pretty sure that they're not considered poisonous, which is what they would be if they had that level of toxicity. From what I see it, or what I read, it appears to just be a deterrent. So it's something that would make it foul tasting and foul smelling, but not necessarily do any real harm to the predator. Yeah, there are known reptile lizard species that are known for being poisonous or venomous. So one of them we discussed in a previous Native Nevada Nature being the Gila monster, um, but there's only a few select lizards that are known for being uh, either poisonous or venomous. And I'm almost sure that the horned lizard is not one of them. They're actually both from the Americas though. I believe the second species is the beaded yeah. lizard. And that's from Central America, Southern Mexico as well. 
So we definitely have some very interesting lizard species here in the yeah, uh, Americas. Exactly. Um, we'll open it up for one quick minute of more of questions. Um, I think, Tyler, you took all these videos that were featured in this uh, presentation, right? Yes, we were lucky enough to run across this guy. And I hadn't seen a horned lizard in almost 20 years since I was a, a child. And so when I saw it, I did a double take. I almost didn't believe that I was looking at what I was looking at. Have you had many experiences with them in the wild? Um, not really. Surprisingly, I've never seen one in Nevada. And I'm, you know, out in the field a lot. I've seen them in California and I've seen them in Utah. But they are very elusive. I mean, they blend in so well. So unless you're actually actively looking at them, I suppose you could just miss them. Yeah, and you can actually see the defense that this lizard is doing. It's not running away. It's really counting on its camouflage right now. And this is part of the reason why you see uh, the decline due to human populations because they're not fleeing the same way some of the other native species would. And I think that might be some of the problems with the pet trade as well. Uh, so we have so we have a question um, uh, asking about their the squirting muscles. I guess the muscles that squirt out the blood. Um, I think you have a little bit more on that, Tyler. Yeah. So if I had to attribute it to a muscle, it would have to be the heart, because it's not a specific muscle that is squirting it. What the lizard does is it restricts flow away from the head. So as the heart is circulating blood towards the head, all of a sudden pressure starts to build as it's not allowed to leave and circulate back to the body. So this increase in pressure on the heads finally ends with a small burst in the capillaries around the eye. That small burst is what allows the blood to shoot up to five feet. So it might appear that there's a muscle that is doing this or some specialized organ, but really it's just very well, very good control over their circulatory system. More better control than we have. <laughs> so, the, so the next question <laughs> oh, I yeah. have, does hiking disrupt them? Uh, the answer is safe hiking should not disrupt them. Um, as long as you maintain on trails, already affixed trails, um, that have clear roads that you can travel on. It should not disturb the horned lizard. They're going to be, uh, generally, reptiles will not just be out in the open, and if they do and you walk by, they'll run away. Um, but they'll be under rocks, they'll be under brush, uh, they'll be on top of rocks, you know, getting all the basking in the sun. So as long as you're not treading over un disturbed or uh, not man made hiking paths, uh, you may disturb them a little bit. Uh, I will say though that even in my wildlife experience being a biologist, I have never triggered a horned lizard to splash its eyes out. You never usually want uh, animals to do their defenses because it's cost them a lot of energy and time to uh, replenish their blood, for instance. Um, but I've never had that happen. But if, as long as you do safe hiking practices, that should uh, prevent you from disturbing the horned lizard. Uh, the ne next question I have is, what is the length of the hibernation and does it vary throughout their geographical region? Um, so to answer your first question, they hibernate usually in the winter. They'll usually go down between November and December, and they'll usually emerge up in the spring between April and March. Usually depends on the temperature. So if there's a colder spring, they might come later in April. If it's a warmer spring, they might emerge early in March. And the same thing when they go back down. If it gets cold really quickly in October, they might go down a little bit sooner. Um, but they'll be looking for some environmental cues. Uh, for instance, if the temperature is like 55 degrees for up to three days straight, then they will emerge. I don't know their specific temperature cues for this uh, desert horned lizard, um, but they'll be looking for that to when they can emerge. And thankfully, all of them reside usually in the deserts, uh, the Sonoran Desert, Mojave Desert, and Great Basin. So all these deserts have very similar characteristics, um, you know, cold winters and warm summers. So they all pretty much have the same cues that they're going to be looking through throughout these geographical regions. 
but it will all be de temperature dependent. So if the horned lizard is living in a geographical area where it doesn't warm up as quickly as our Mojave Desert, then they won't come out until they're, they have enough energy and there's enough uh, sunlight to supply them that energy to go hunting. So our northern species might be a little bit longer um, slumber than we would see down here in Las Vegas or in the southern species. Yeah, because they definitely have colder winters and longer winters. Um, but generally, they're all looking for the same uh, geographical cues or temperature cues. Um, but I, yeah, I That's think great. that was our last question. If you have any further questions and or a question right now that we didn't get to, um, go ahead and just put it in the comment section of this video. And um, I will definitely look at it after this presentation and get you the answers you need. Um, but Explorer Tyler, why don't you tell us about the activities? Yeah, so we want to thank everyone who participates in our activities, our weekly activities. We had the um, coloring page, the Horned Lizard coloring page. If you do complete it, fill it out. Feel free to drop it in and comment. Uh, tag us in a post. We would love to see your drawings and your pictures of the horned lizards. Um, and then this week's activity is really special. This week we're going to use clues within our activity to find out what next week's surprise plant or animal is going to be. So we have a few questions here. We're going to figure out the common name of the NNN plant by answering these clues. So as you go through and solve these questions and solve these clues, each word or each clue will give you a new letter and then eventually you'll figure out what next week's surprise native nevada nature mm -hmm. plant is yeah good luck explorers on the clue uh it will be released later on this evening after this episode and the answer will be revealed on friday so uh good luck with that uh, you know as these word puzzles come you know they're a little bit challenging but if you use your Explorer mind, I, I believe you can do it. And once again, if you finish it, go ahead and share it on our Facebook event page or our Nevada Conservation League page. We'd love to see you guys completing it. Let's see who your it out can be. Yeah, exactly. All right. Uh, well, thank you, Explorer Tyler, for being on the show today. I really appreciated your herpetology knowledge. Thank you for having me. I love being on this show any chance I get, and I hope to come on here and talk about more reptiles. <laughs> Definitely. Um, but until next time, uh, make sure to like, comment, give us a share to your friends and family if you like what you're watching. We want to continue to do Native Nevada Nature to teach uh, natives about our native land. Uh, so uh, just let us know that you're enjoying what you're seeing and um, so that we can get the feedback we need to continue to do this show. Um, but as always, just tune in every Wednesday at 5 p.m. Uh, to see the weekly spotlight on one native plant or animal species. Um, but until then, keep on exploring.